Welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Authors Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is Taking Care. We'll be celebrating all the ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our full upcoming schedule at wab.org. We're so excited to have Mary Frances Winters with us this evening. First, we'll hear from her, and then she'll be in conversation with Stephanie Paredes, who is the Assistant Director of Multicultural Programs in the Division for Diversity and Inclusion at RIT. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Mary Frances Winter's book is available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. In Black Fatigue, How Racism Erodes the Mind, Body, and Spirit, Mary Frances Winters explores the intergenerational impact of systemic racism on the physical and psychological health of Black people and explains why and how society needs to collectively do more to combat its pernicious effects. Mary Frances Winters is the founder and president of Winters Group Incorporated and the author of six books, including We Can't Talk About That at Work and Inclusive Conversations. Named a top 10 diversity trailblazer by Forbes and a diversity pioneer by Profiles in Diversity Journal, she is the recipient of the prestigious Athena Award and the Winds of Change Award from the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. She has been helping clients create inclusive environments for over three decades. Mary Frances, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's all yours. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I thought, um, I thought Stephanie was going to um, ask me some questions first, but I guess not. <laughs> so I will go ahead and um, start my reading. I guess the questions come later. And we invite you all to ask, um, to put questions um, in the chat. Um, I would um, be happy to answer them as we go along. Um, so I am going to read uh, from my book, Black Fatigue, How Racism Erodes um, the Mind, Body, and Spirit. Uh, but first, I want to give you a little bit of background in terms of why I uh, wrote the book. Uh, I do diversity and inclusion consulting and have for 37 years. As a matter of fact, um, March 16th, two days ago, was our 37th year in business. I started the business in Rochester, New York, uh, and was there until 2004 is when I left, uh, I left Rochester, but formed the business there and have very fond memories of Rochester. In my consulting work, um, I was hearing particularly from uh, millennials and the fact that I've been in business for 37 years tells you I'm not a millennial, but I was hearing from millennials that they were, they were exhausted, particularly millennials of color in the workplace. Most of the work that I do is in the workplace and they were um, exhausted. And I was like, you know, you're 30 years old. How are you exhausted already? And they give me the side eye. We know we're exhausted. And they were talking about, you know, the microaggressions and the continued um, inability to be themselves in the workplace, the continued feeling that they had to um, assimilate, uh, continued isolation of being one or one of a few and tokenization. And so I really started to think about, you know, did I feel fatigue? Because I've been doing this work for so long. And I think in some ways you normalize it. Uh, and, I, and it just really sparked me to, uh, to write this book. Um, I had the idea for the book uh, before um, the 2020 protests uh, and the racial reckoning and resurgence and interest in racial equity um, that, that started. Um, so this is something that obviously has, has been going on long before uh, what happened uh, last year. Uh, but I do incorporate in the book um, some the impact of some of those events and how that those events exacerbated um, the black uh, fatigue. So I'm gonna start reading now. Black fatigue runs deep. Domaine D. Williams is a black man. He's a New York City public advocate. In passionate 
and tear-filled extemporaneous comments at a press conference regarding the killing of Amon Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd in the spring of 2020, he said this about the impact of racism and police brutality on the Black community. I am not okay. I am not okay today. I want to give the Black community permission to say, I am not okay. I am tired. I am tired. I have not watched the video of Amon Arbery. It is too much. I have not watched the video of George Floyd. It is too much. Black people have to go to work the next day and be all right. I am not okay. I am tired. I am tired of racism. Mr. Williams described black fatigue. I define black fatigue in chapter two as repeated variations of stress that result in extreme exhaustion and cause mental, physical, and spiritual maladies that are passed down from generation to generation. The fatigue of enduring unrelenting racist systems was not new with the 2020 protests. What was new is that black people from the famous to the everyday citizen were given permission to take off the proverbial muzzle to tell the world about their pain and rage without fear of the normal backlash. For example, why do you people always call the race card? It seems like the world was finally willing to listen. Black people were no longer denying or suppressing the emotional toll. We were boldly and poignantly calling out the impact of living in a racist world and demanding actions that put more of the burden on white people to change the racist systems. White people could no longer claim sublime ignorance as I talk about in chapter two. Black people have been marching and protesting and resisting and writing and orating and praying and legislating and commentating for centuries for equity and justice. And young and old, we're fatigued. It is physically, mentally, and emotionally draining day after day to continue to experience inequities and even autocracies when justice, equity, and fairness are purportedly legislated rights of all citizens of these United States of America. During the height of the 2020 protests, I facilitated many listening and learning sessions for clients. I was asked to serve on several panels with CEOs and key leaders of organizations. These virtual town hall gatherings were usually open to all employees and often included black panelists who shared personal stories. Several times, CEOs admitted that they did not know about the daily challenges of navigating life as a black person. One CEO, whose chief financial officer is black, said that he was embarrassed that he had not known his C that he had, I'm sorry, that he had known his CFO for many years and had no sense of the emotional toll he faced living while black. This is what black fatigue, how racism erodes the mind, body, and spirit is about. It is about the fatigue that comes from the pain and anguish of living with racism every single day of your life. It is about being fatigued by those who are surprised and express outrage with no action that such inequities still exist. It is about the constant fatigue of not knowing if you or a loved one will come home alive. It is about enduring the ravages of intergenerational racism. I'm a child of the 60s. As the editor of my high school newspaper, I wrote about the ills of discrimination. I was a writer for my college newspaper where I wrote about University of Rochester, where I wrote about racist behaviors and participated in rallies and marches protesting inequitable treatment. Essentially, my whole career has been dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And it is mind boggling, fatiguing to realize that not much has changed. I explore my black fatigue in chapter one. The injustices that I write about in this book have been, have been recounted over the centuries by great writers, politicians, theologians, educators, and as important everyday people who come into the limelight because of a lived experience that shocks and appalls us like the George Floyds or the Eric Garners or the Sandra Blands of the world that lets us know, all know that even though we might want to believe that we have overcome bigotry, injustice, hatred, and race-based violence, the sad truth is that it is not so. Systems of oppression continue to loom large. Many race-based inequities are just as prevalent today as they were 400 years ago. In chapter three, then is now, I chronicle the lack of progress in addressing racism in the United States. While we might want to rest on our laurels on the progress from slavery to freedom to modern day wins like the pinnacle achievement, the election of Barack Obama as president, I dare say those who throughout history fought for equal rights would not be satisfied, nor should we be. While we might want to congratulate ourselves for legislation that makes overt acts of racism illegal, 
They still happen too frequently and often continue to require more legal actions to address racist practices. Consider the Crown Act as a recent example of legislation that protects the right of black people to wear our hair in its natural state. Some six states and jurisdictions have passed the act and 20 more states are considering it. The bill was also introduced to Congress for federal legislation in for federal protection in 2019. It is incomprehensible to think that we need a law to protect the right to wear our hair as we prefer, that such oppression still exists. It is indeed fatiguing to have to put energy to struggle for what on the surface seems like a laughable issue. Black fatigue is a research informed narrative on the causes and consequences of black fatigue. I chronicle my personal lived experiences and those of family, colleagues, and friends. It is chock full of historical data and stories that illuminate the woeful lack of progress in achieving socioeconomic health, educational voting rights, and criminal justice equity over the past three plus centuries. Even though some black people have achieved mobility and access, even we are not exempt from anti-black racism. The book highlights the complexities of the interconnected, multi-layered, compounding factors caused by racism that perpetuate the cycle of fatigue. Navigating centuries-old racist systems lead to intergenerational stress and trauma, increasing inherit inherited health disparities, which manifest as generations of oppressively inequitable life experiences and outcomes for Black people. Many municipalities have declared racism a public health emergency. Science has proven that racism is a direct cause of physiological and psychological maladies. Black people suffer disproportionately from diseases such as high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, obesity, among others. Many of these health issues are uncorrelated to socioeconomic status. In other words, contrary to what might seem intuitive, education and income are not mitigators. Further, experts have recently made connections to how chronic stress impacts us at the cellular level and is passed down generationally. Chapter four is devoted to exploring inequities in health outcomes. While the title of the book, Black Fatigue, there are multiple layers that need consideration because of our intersectional identities. I am a cisgender, heterosexual black woman born into the baby boom generation. My income puts me in the middle class category. I am able-bodied. I have not been a victim of domestic violence. I was raised in a two parent household, albeit a lower income one. My gender identity, sexual orientation, income, and physical and mental status, and other social factors are privileges that Black people who are, for example, in the LGBTQ community who are poor, are subjected to violence, and or experience disabilities may not enjoy. The compounding stressors of one's intersectional identities exacerbates the fatigue, which I explore in chapter five. Chapter six, seven, and eight speak to Black fatigue for women, men, and children, respectively. I offer solutions throughout the book and in detail in chapter nine. Racism happens at several levels, interpersonal, internalized, institutional, and structural. Intra and interpersonal solutions for black people to address racism, in, uh, racism induced fatigue, such as resistance, healing, restoration, faith, rest, and resilience are important, but not end game remedies because they do not solve the root cause. They only treat the symptoms and dull the pain. From an intra and interpersonal level, white people can help mitigate black fatigue by acknowledging your whiteness and thus privilege, doing your own education on the history of racism and becoming an anti-racist ally challenging white supremacy. For those who may not understand what some of these terms mean, I define them in chapter two. At the institutional and structural levels, as a start, the US needs to atone for slavery publicly and offer reparations to descendants of slaves. We also need those in power to abolish racist legislation, policies, and practices. It can be done quickly, as we witnessed during the 2020 racial protests. Within a two-week period, motions were filed in states and municipalities across the country to defund police departments, ban chokeholds, the use of tear gas, and to update use of force rules. Some companies declared Juneteenth a paid holiday, and a handful of CEOs who showed themselves to be racist stepped down. At the request of a 22-year-old Black woman, Miriam Webster Dictionary agreed within weeks of the request to change the definition of racism to include the structural component. It should not have taken a global rebellion for racial justice to bring about these types of changes. However, it did, demonstrating that systems can be changed when those with power choose to exercise it on behalf of dismantling white supremacist cultures.
The corporate world, world needs to embrace more of a social justice rather than merely a capitalistic approach to what has become known as diversity, equity, and inclusion. We need diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. In chapter nine, I reimagine a decolonized world that bends toward racial justice. In that world, we would never see another black person gunned down by law enforcement or anybody else solely on the basis of their race. Black people would truly feel based on equitable treatment like we belong in our own country. We would count on all the systems to work just as well for black people as they do for white people. We would focus on achieving equity, not just equality. White people would no longer on the one hand appropriate our culture and on the other treat us as inferior beings. White people would understand that because white culture is normal, it renders all others as abnormal by default. White people would understand white supremacy and that it will end only when white people see it as a white issue rather than a black issue that they empathize with. White people would um, heed Robin DiAngelo's advice, um, Robin DiAngelo's advice and face their white fragility. So I ran out of paper <laughs> and uh, didn't print everything. So let me continue. I have it on my screen. Um, I'm just going to read just a little bit more. So I'll start with that sentence. White people would heed Robin DiAngelo's advice and face their white fragility, the defensiveness that often arises with discussions of race. White people must address institutional and structural racism. Black people do not have the power to change white supremacist systems. Prolific writer and social activist for Black liberation, James Baldwin called whites the innocents in an essay, My Dungeon Shook, in the form of a letter to his nephew in the fire next time. He asserted that white people by and large believe themselves to be absolved of any accountability for the racist systems for the racist systems that, that exist. He asserted that it was not the responsibility of black people to fix racism. However, he held optimism that working together, black and white people could affect change. Baldwin died in 1987 without seeing his hope come to fruition. Sadly, some 30 years later, we have not seen that hope realized. It is too soon to tell if the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement for racial justice will lead to sustained change. I, like James Baldwin, am still hopeful. Thank you so much, Francis. That was incredible and I loved hearing it. It's like when you read the book and you hear the voice that actually wrote the book, it's like all of that. So much to unpack in this book, so much great information in this book. Now, I want to start by saying I am so excited to be here with you. When I heard of this opportunity and we are you know, connected through our RIT connection, being a past the net professor at RIT, which is you know very prestigious in our division, I was even more excited about it. And then when I got this book and, and read it, it was something that finally I could put words to things as they say, because sometimes you just have the words, but you don't have the term to mm -hmm. so even validate what you're saying. So I know we're limited on time, but this is what I wanna start with. Who is Mary Frances Winters? We know the author, we know the Manette professor, we know the business owner, we know the consultant, we know all of these intersectionalities that you have in terms of who you are. Tell us a little bit about Mary Frances Winters growing up, a little bit about your background. So I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York, um, not too far from uh, Rochester. My I, I was adopted. I was adopted at 18 months. I don't know anything about my biological uh, family. Uh, my adopted um, parents were Canadians. Um, actually, my mother's family got into Canada. Um, her ancestors got into through Canada through the, through the Underground Railroad. They hailed out of Maryland. Uh, my father, um, uh, his family uh, was out of Virginia, uh, but his both of his parents died at a very young age of tuberculosis, and he was raised by an uncle on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls, so Niagara Falls, Ontario. So I kind of feel, you know, a little bit that I'm uh, bicultural because I spent a lot of time. My, my mother was a Canadian until she died young at 57, but she was a Canadian through and through. Uh, so I grew up in a household. Uh, I was an only child. I was 15 years old, and they adopted my my, my brother. 
Um, I grew up as, you know, I, I grew up as an only child, small town, um, but really always conscious because at five years old, I was called the N word. And it was, mm. it, and I talk about that in the book and it, um, it changed my life because, you know, five year old, somebody might not like me because of my color. You know, I don't know anything about psychology, sociology, racism at five years old, right? Right. <laughs> but, and so when I do training, I find that many of us had our first experience very, very young, where we recognized that we were that we were somehow different, and that difference made a difference, um, and people might be mean to you because of it. And so that turned me from this carefree kid, you know, the world is my, I can do anything I want, to this very cautious, like, you know, like you mean um, somebody like might not like me? Um, so yeah, so, so that's kind of, you know, who I am. A first generation college graduate, my parents had eighth, ninth grade education, However, uh, all through, you know, my, my little street on, not in, on Niagara Falls, Eli Avenue was all prim primarily all black. We were surrounded by whites all around that um, street. And everybody knew on that street that Mary Frances was going to college. They called me Mary Frances. Mary Frances. Mary Frances is going to college. <laughs> Nobody on the street went to college, but Mary Frances is going to college, right? So, yeah. so I had that instilled. You know, very early. As they say, good news spreads fast, right? <laughs> good news spreads fast, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Great. Thanks for sharing that story. You know, as we look at this book and the journey that you've taken to even get here to write this book, one of the things, you know, immediately upon opening the book, you know, you always just kind of like, oh, let's see what page kind of opens up. Now there's this image at the beginning of your book that when I saw it, it's this image of the tree here. Mm -hmm. When I saw it, it kind of, again, I, I'm a visual person so much. When I saw this, this made so much sense to me. How, for those who may not have picked up the book just yet, which it is available now, so make sure you get your book from Magazine Books. Um, talk to me about what inspired this image. And for those who haven't seen it, it is a, there is a tree and at the bottom of it, the roots is the, the um, system, seismic racism, we have black fatigue, and then the branches are environmental racism, economic inequities, health disparities, lower pace, there, there's so much happening on this one image. Talk to us a little bit about how did the inspiration behind this image, where, where did it come from and, and the purpose of it being included in the book? Because I think if you see nothing else in the book, this image is very impactful. So the image is to, and, and by the way, the image was um, uh, drawn by somebody who works for me. She's she's my um, she does bookkeeping and finance for the Winters Group, but she also has a talent in art. So I wanted to, and she's a black woman, and I wanted to amplify you know her work. Uh, so this mm -hmm. image uh, shows that systemic racism is oftentimes you know underneath the soil in the roots, and you know you can't see it, right? It, it's not it's not able to be seen. However, what grows from that systemic racism is are the health disparities the racism in the workplace, the racial profiling, economic, you know, environmental racism, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the leaves, um, you know, you see how those things um, manifest. And so economic inequities, you know, high poverty rates, uh, low net worth, um, you know, racial profiling, mass incarceration. And so those are the leaves, those are the, those are the things that happen. And so wanting to show that, you know, systemic racism, we haven't tackled it because oftentimes we can't see it really, I mean, we see the manifestation of it, but it's really important for us to uh, really uh, dig deep and do what I call reverse engineering and go back and back and back and back and back and say, where, you know, wh where did, you know, where did this come from? Because right now, and what we've done for years is we're trying to fix the people who are the victims of the systemic racism, right? So, yes. so yeah, yes. so let's fix, let's fix black people, right? Um, it's, it's not the problem. It's us. We have to fix, you know, what is wrong with you, the community? What is wrong with you, the individual, you know? And I think you make such a great point is that we don't want to get to the root of the problem because the responsibility right. is not on the people that are being oppressed. Right. It's the oppressor. The oppressor right. must make the changes. You make right. such a great point there. And I think that's something that a lot of people always miss is that we have become such a reactive work mm -hmm. and not proactive. So like you said, we have to get to the root of what is going on. So it is important to keep going back and saying, okay, we know this, you know, X is happening, but 
the X, there was A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all of these reasons we got to go back to the beginning. Why is it that people don't want to start? In your because, it's, because it's so hard, because it's hard, because it's painful, because it's entrenched and it's all interrelated and intertwined and to, um, and to undo it, you know, it, it takes, it would, it would just take, so, you know, really to undo it, it it's really like, you know, um, starting all over again, like uprooting that tree. Yes. And starting new our, roots. Exactly. Right. I'm scared to start new roots because change is hard for a lot of people, but it's only, in my opinion, it's only hard when you've been comfortable for so long with the status quo mm -hmm. that in exactly. order to kind of change that, yes, I understand that's scary for some people, but it's also necessary. So the title of this book, Black Fatigue, How Racism Erodes the Mind, Body, and Spirit. You know, one of the things that you talk about in chapter one is, you know, when did your black fatigue start? And you share a very, you know, story about when you were, um, when you were five years old. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the five-year-old was was the was the little kid who called me the N-word. That was that was that that was that um, situation, and um, you know, changed me forever. Um, when that you know, because, happened, what was what was your immediate when you go home? How was that conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the conversation um, was you know this this little kid called me this you know. I remember, so I remember his name. I remember exactly what he looked like. That's how impactful it was, you know, um, on me. I remember his first name, his last name. I remember everything about him. That's how impactful it was. But I talked to my parents and of course, you know, five year, again, I'm five years old and I'm trying to understand, you know, what, you know, racism, but, you know, we, we talk about the, the talk that um, parents have to have with uh, with particularly black, black sons, you know, yeah. about, um, engagement with law enforcement, but it starts even, you know, sooner than that. It starts, you know, with, you know, the first time um, somebody um, called you out. So my, um, my six-year-old little girl, who's just like a granddaughter to me um, recently, uh, was in the um, schoolyard playing. And um, the little girl said to her, well, you can't play family because you're black. Ooh. And then she said, well, if you pretend to be white, then you can play. Wow. So Savannah's her name. So Savannah, you know, refused to, to pretend to be white and she started crying. And so then the teachers got involved and they had to go, they went in, back into inside and had to have a sit down to have a discussion about, you know, what, you know, what, what all of this meant. So, you know, Savannah's six and I'm <clears throat> many more. Years, well, I'll tell everybody I turned on March 13th. I turned 70 years old. So I'm 70 years old. Right. So it's been a long time years young, Mary Frances, 70 years young. Se 70 years, however it goes, <laughs> oh, young old. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's been a long time since I've been six years old, but to think about, uh, think about that Savannah in 2021 is still experiencing these kinds of things when all she wants to do, you know, is have fun, play with, the, play with kids and not have to worry about, uh, and so, that, so there's fatigue, right? So, so, so fatigue starts there. And it also, you know, with her parents, so her parents had to, you know, stop what they were doing, you know, um, not only, you know, try to talk to Savannah, but also deal with the school, you know. Um, and so that happened. And then two weeks later, um, so this was still in February, they were doing a lesson on um, historical figures who had good, who are of great character. So the lesson was on character. Yeah. And the person that they chose to highlight was Thomas Jefferson. So and I have the I have the pictures of, of the, the lesson. So Thomas Jefferson was and one of the reasons that he was of good character is because he owned a lot of land. That was one of the reasons. So again, a capitalistic. So my point then is now, you know, we're still teaching children. You know, and I'm sure Thomas, Je I know Thomas Jefferson, of course, did some good things. However, it was Black History Month. So you think if you're doing a character lesson during Black History Month, you might have at least, you know, tried to pick a Black person, right? Very least. <laughs> That's like the easiest thing that you could have done. Right, yeah. And, and to pull Thomas favorite. Jefferson up as, you know, and so, we're, so, so we haven't changed what we're teaching, you know, children. Um, I mean, obviously Thomas Jefferson was a historical figure, but, if, but he, he's the epitome of character. That's who you chose as the epitome of character? That, that makes me question your character for your choice. 
<laughs> so one of the things, um, you know, as they say, from the mouths of babes, right? I have, um, I, I have an Afro Latino son, and you know, he, it is definitely something, you know, in the midst of, he's four years old now, although he looks like he's six years old. He's a tall, <laughs> he's a tall boy, and I think about the talk that I have to have with him. You know, a lot of the talk for us as communities of color, especially black communities is very different than other communities may have to have the talk. Um, one of the things that I reflect on, you know, as a mom is how do I approach the talk without scaring him? And how do I make sure, you know, do the best that I can be, do the best that I can do as his mom to ensure that the, when we talk about inter intergenerational trauma and how that manifests itself, you put here on in your chapter four, page 80, and I will quote you. <laughs> um, when we're talking about racism leads to race-based intergenerational trauma, one may express the trauma through anxiety, anger, rage, depression, low self-esteem or shame, and it manifests itself as depression, fatigue, diseases such as high blood pressure or diabetes or mental disorders. These are the things, especially in Black communities, that when we go to the doctor and we say we feel these things, it's, it's minimized. It's sometimes dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't feel that way. Or you have X, Y, Z. You can't feel that way. Why would you? And it's this constant battle of validating how you feel mm -hmm. to a doctor, to a counselor, whoever, and not having the medical community understand intergenerational trauma and how that because they're so focused on the you know well you don't portray these symptoms or maybe you don't necessarily fit into a box of mm -hmm. I think you should be feeling right. how we start to when we know there's no easy fix to racial inequities of course in healthcare mm -hmm. what is a good starting point for us as um communities of color especially black communities to talk about our feelings and understand that we are validated in those feelings. And how do we do that? How can we better advocate for ourselves, but also on the other end, what can we help communities do better? And I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, so I think, you know, starting with um, your, you say four-year-old, right? I think, um, I think we do have to be honest with our children. I think we have to tell them the truth in age-appropriate um, age language. I don't think that we, um, can or should, you know, sugarcoat um, and not provide the realities. However, I also think, not however, but and, I also think that, uh, that it, as, as parents, we need to provide um, the happiest, best, joyful kind of experience, uh, you know, for our children, um, you know, that, that we can. Uh, we have to avoid adultification uh, because the white world adultifies, you know, you said that your four-year-old looks like a six-year-old, right? Uh, my son, when he was uh, four, he looked like an eight-year-old or six-year-old. Six He's like six foot five now, you know, all grown, but he had all sorts of issues because of his size and his color, you know, um, in, uh, in school. And I, I don't think I was, um, and I, I, got, I became angry at a lot of the situations that he found himself in. This is my son, who is a Harvard Duke Princeton graduate and is now um, a full tenured professor of religion at Duke University. Um, he, had, he had all sorts of... Um, issues early on um, in his life um, where he was, he was kicked out of Montessori school because he didn't string beads the Montessori way. He, you know, it just all sorts of, you know, issues. When he was 12, he, I found him in the back of a police car and they said he was apprehended the suspect because somebody bullied him. And he, I mean, he just went through all it. So when he was in fourth grade though, his fourth grade teacher was a white male said, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with Joe, except he, um, you know, except I think he's brilliant, you know, and so once we changed, once we reframed what was going on with, with Joe, and he was probably bored in, in class, he, you know, his valedictorian at McQuay Jesuit High School, the, the year that, that he graduated, straight 4.0 average, and so it was, we had to change that narrative, right, and a, his fourth grade teacher helped, so I would just say with your, with your children, don't allow them to be adult of a kid, and we do it too, we call, we call um, our, our little, in the black community, little man, right, we make them men before they're, you know, let them be boys. So, you know, why, do, why do they have to be men, right? Yes, let them be boys. Let them have the joy and the innocence that they deserve. And right. 
try not to like coddle them so much in terms of like, you know, you want to protect your baby from everything and everybody. But I think, you know, for us, it's important to understand, you know, where do we need to do better as parents and not kind of get swayed by what society expects of us to teach our kids mm -hmm. to do it and what to do it and in the manner to do it. And, you know, we know our kids better than anybody, as they say. So um, you had mentioned something earlier. I'm going to take a question right now from the chat. Um, someone said, sublime ignorance. I love this term that you coined. Do you mind unpacking how and why this is different from ignorance? So sublime ignorance is for me that you have the privilege and power to be ignorant. Nobody is, um, nobody is um, expecting you or, or asking you to not be ignorant. So it's sublime. I can just go through life just ignorant. I don't have to. I don't have to think about racism. I don't have to think about these things. And I can just be sublimely ignorant and, and go through life thinking that all is well. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a racist. I love everybody. Right, so that's the non-racist versus the versus the um, the you know the the, the anti-racist. So so I and so to all of this, the ignorance that I heard, you know, after George Floyd, with all of these top-level people coming out saying, you know, we didn't know, and even with the pandemic and and how it was impacting Black and Brown communities disproportionately, saying, oh, we didn't know that there were health disparities. Where have y'all been? So that to me, that's sublime ignorance. You know? Yeah, but you chose not to open up your eyes to mm -hmm. the, I've been looking right. for this whole time, but did you ever look the other way? Did you mm -hmm. ever the other question? Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. So um, there's another question here in the chat. Um, Ms. Winters, what is your vision for reparations, sometimes called unrealistic by those in power? And what do you recommend as actions for advancing this cause? You know, so, so reparations don't, don't always have to be um, monetary reparations. Um, it is um, repairing the harm. So some of the um, colleges, universities, uh, you know, Georgetown, and I think Princeton is the other one that I think I heard about. Is it Princeton? Yeah, I was gonna say, my son went to Princeton, yeah, Princeton, where they are looking at doing things like offering scholarships to, well, I guess it's monetary, but it's, I mean, I think people get upset when you think about a reparation being, um, we're gonna we're gonna send you know checks to all African Americans. Now, I'm not saying that that's, that would be necessarily the wrong thing to do, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying that we need to think about reparations more broadly. It's repairing the harm, acknowledging the harm. So people will say you know um, acknowledging slavery. Well, that's just you know that's that's just symbolic. It's more than symbolic because you know in South Africa you know it took them to truth and reconciliation. Right, we've got to tell the truth. So I was telling you about this, you know, history book that really wasn't telling this history lesson that my little granddaughter had. It really wasn't, you know, telling the, the whole truth, right? And so we have to tell the truth and then reconcile what harm has this done? Because if you don't acknowledge that harm has been done, then there's nothing for you to do to correct it. And we can go to this individualistic place, which we do in the United States. We're all just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? We everybody has the same chance. I read this. Um, Wall Street Journal article about, you know, um, how equity was, you know, negative equity led leads to, I don't know, revert, well, some bad thing, but the, the, I, and the, the author was talking about um, equality of opportunity um, versus equality of outcomes. So he believed in equality of opportunity, but, but when you give that same opportunity, if you don't get the, the, the outcome, then that's not, that's the person's fault. That's the individual's, that's the individual's fault, right? And so the fallacy in that, of course, is that um, if, you know, everybody's probably seen the, the cartoon with the three kids on the box, right? And so, you know, you give yeah. everybody the same box, but everybody doesn't need the same box. You know, some people already have three boxes, right? And they don't need another box. Exactly. Or they, or they can see over the, they can see over the, so that, so that's what's missing in, in this, in this dialogue. I have clients who refuse to put equity in their, you know, in their um, acronym for diversity because because of, because they say, well, you know, people don't believe um, equity because equity leads to um, to preferential treatment. Yes, we should be giving preferential treatment. So so that 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 could be a, that could be a reparation in and of itself to say yes, we are going to give um, something more 
to, you know, to this group than we, um, because of the harm that we have, uh, have caused, because of the harm that society, and because we're so individualistic, people will say, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't cause that harm. <laughs> well, that was nobody, yeah, I wasn't nobody, nobody said that you did, <laughs> but right. we have a collective, we have a collective accountability, a collective responsibility to make the world better. If in fact we believe in and liberty and justice for all, if exactly. we truly for, believe for, for all, because we don't have justice for all and we can see it and we'll know when we have it, when we can no longer predict outcomes by one's identity. When we can no longer predict outcomes by one's identity, we'll know that we're there. And in effectively every aspect of the world, we can still predict outcomes by one's identity. Um, so yeah, so that's what I, when I say, when, when I talk about you know, reparations, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about necessarily sending everybody a check. I'm talking about um, repairing the harm wherever it is. I hope that helps the um the caller. I mean the question towards the but had the question. No, absolutely. And I know we, we have about three minutes left. And I just think that what you said right now is a is a great, you know, segue to kind of get these final, you know, rapid fire questions um going for you is that we must acknowledge what has happened. We must acknowledge the truth. Then we can talk about the rest. I think what you said is so important that we begin with just acknowledge what has been happening just say and say that it was wrong and that it was wrong exactly. <laughs> it was wrong yeah. take right. accountability and responsibility for it right then we can go from there that is mm -hmm. so um so thank you so much and we're going to be wrapping up here soon i could talk to you forever um about this book because there's just so much to unpack in here so much really good information and also for those who have not picked up the book yet there are some great conversation starters here. My book is all marked up and highlighted and underlined I'll, and folded over with the pages. There was just so many great things here as well. And so before we end here, um, of course, we want to encourage everyone to purchase Black Fatigue as soon as possible, create a book club, join the book club, recommend this book. This is really, really a special book that you wrote because I've never, seen anything like this written before and all of the things that you include in here Mary Frances is something that everyone no matter your background you should be reading this book um and so thank you for your work and effort in making this book happen and thank you for sharing that with us and so before we leave I'm going to give you some fun rapid fire questions to end us on a little bit of a light note and also get to know a little bit more about Mary Frances so there's no right or wrong answer to this, Mary Francis. The first thing that comes to mind, okay? Okay. What is your favorite color? Purple. <laughs> Me too. Okay. <laughs> what is in your refrigerator right now? Um, I am on a vegan diet, and Ooh. I get my vegan food. I get my vegan food from uh, a woman-owned business called Nourish Charlotte. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina now. Uh, so I have um, containers of like rolled oat stuff and uh, vegetables and uh, uh, sort of some kind of vegan pizza, something or another. Yeah, so it's all really good too. So that's what's in my refrigerator. And kombucha. I love kombucha. <laughs> Ooh, yes. If you could trade places with any other person for a week, famous or not famous, living or not, real or fictional, who would it be? So if I could be with a per uh, somebody for a week? If you could trade places with someone. Oh, trade places with somebody for a week. Oh, if I could trade places with somebody for a week. Oh, I don't want to say, I don't want to, um, hmm. I don't want to be trite about this, but the person that comes to mind is Michelle Obama. So I'll just yeah. say it. <laughs> I mean, who would it, right? I could hang out with her or we could trade places. Time for me. A um, couple of last final questions. If Hollywood made a movie about your life, who would you, who would play Mary Francis Winter? Oh, who would play me if there were a movie about myself? Um, it would probably be um, Angela Bass. Um, Angela Bassett. Angela Bassett, yes. Yeah. She, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. If you were a type of food, what type of food would you be? If I was a type of food, um, I would be chocolate cake with chocolate icing. It's my favorite. <laughs> 
but now that I'm on the vegan diet, I have to, you know, eat vegan chocolate cake. It's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the final question. How would you describe yourself in three words? Um, passionate, committed, and spiritual. Perfect. Mind, body, and spirit. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mary Frances. And I want to thank all of everyone out there in Zoom land for joining us here today. And we'll bring Dan Hurd back in from Writings and Books to wrap us up on some things. So, you know, make sure you get your book, order it for a friend, and then order another one and give it to another friend. Thank you again, Mary Frances. Dan? Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Mary Frances. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I want to thank our co-sponsors, Qualey and the RIT Division for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, buy Black Fatigue at Ampersand Books. The link is in the chat. And you can also catch up with videos of our past readings, uh, including this one. Uh, it'll be on our website, wab.org. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, have a great night. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.